Section 1.7 is on piecewise functions and analyzing graphs of functions. So first we're going to look at how do we test for symmetry. So a graph could be symmetric with respect to the y-axis, the x-axis, or the origin. If it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis, then we'd substitute negative x for x, and if it results in an equivalent equation, meaning the original equation for the function, then that means it's symmetric with respect to the x, or excuse me, y-axis. And when you have points that are symmetric with respect to the y-axis, then it's like this. The point x, y would be negative x, y. Okay, it just changes your x um, whether it's negative or positive to the opposite. Symmetric with respect to the x-axis, to test for this we substitute negative y for y. And again, if you've got the point x, y, then you're going to end up with the point x negative y. So that explains why we substitute y for y and see if it results in an equivalent equation. And then respect, symmetric with respect for, to the origin is changing the sign for both x and y. So x, y would be negative x, negative y. And if we plug in for both, and it results in the same function as the original, then we know we have a function that's symmetric with respect to the origin without even looking at the graph. So for example one, we're going to test for these three symmetries. So first we'll do with respect to the y-axis, and in that case we let x be negative. And notice how I'm putting it, um, the, the negative inside parentheses, because we're raising, we're literally substituting negative x for x. And so if we're raising x to the third power, then we're raising x, negative x to the third power. And when we raise negative x to the third power, we get negative x cubed. That would be negative x times negative x times negative x, which gives you a negative. So no... this function is not symmetric with respect to the x-axis, okay, or the y-axis, excuse me. Okay, so now we'll test the x-axis, and in this case, we let y be negative. If we solve for y, then that brings the negative over, and again, we don't have an equivalent equation. y equals negative x cubed is not the same as y equals x cubed. And then last, we'll test for symmetry with the origin. And so we let y be negative and x be negative. So we've got negative y equals negative x cubed. And if we divide both sides by negative 1, then we do get an equivalent equation to the original. So yes, we are symmetric with respect to the origin. Okay, so let's try just a couple more examples here. For this one, when we test the y-axis, we're putting in a negative x and I wrote that wrong. Oh, I got a kitty meowing for some reason. So we've got negative x squared and that gives us a positive x squared because it's negative x times negative x. So we do have an equivalent function here. 
equation. So we can say that it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. But let's go ahead and check the x and the origin because it could be have symmetry with more than one. So in this case, we're putting in a negative y. And we'll divide both sides by negative one, but we don't have an equivalent equation. So no, it's not symmetric with respect to the x-axis. And then the origin, we plug in both negative y and negative x. And this one, we also don't get an equivalent equation, so no, it's not symmetric with respect to the origin. So this one is symmetric with respect to the y axis. Sorry about the kitty. I think she wants to go outside, but she's not allowed. Okay, example three, same deal. This book likes to give us a lot of examples, which is not a bad thing. So we're plugging in negative for x. And we don't have to go all the way through solving for y or anything because if we put in negative for x here, we see we've got an equivalent equation there. And then to test symmetry to the x-axis, we let y be negative. And you can already see that this one is not going to give us an equivalent. And then we'll try the origin, where we'll make x negative and y negative. But we've still got that negative y in there that's going to mess us up. So no, it's not symmetric with respect to the origin. So we are symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And one more of these. Try for the y-axis. We let x be negative, and the absolute value of negative x is just positive x. So yes, we are symmetric with respect to the y-axis. My goodness, she's loud. Okay, negative y. If we solve this for y, we get negative, the absolute value of x plus 2, which is not the same. And then for the origin, negative y and negative x, and that would make our negative, absolute value of negative x is x, but we, if we bring the negative over, then no, we're not symmetric with respect to the origin. So we are only, for example, for symmetric with respect to the y-axis. The next concept is to determine if a function is even or odd, okay? And again, we're still checking for symmetry here in a way because if a function is even, then it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. If a function is odd, it's symmetric with respect to the origin. But there's another way that we can test for these two, and that is for an even function, if we plug in a negative x, then it should be the same. We've already done that. For an odd function, if we plug in negative x, then we should get out whatever negative f of x would be. So you'll see what I mean by that here in a second.
Okay, so first let's test this one. We'll plug in negative x. And so we've got negative x cubed minus negative x, not 2, squared plus 2. And that'll give us negative x cubed minus x squared, because that negative x squared becomes positive, and, but there's still a minus out front, plus 2. Well, this is not the same as the original function, so we can already say that this function is not even. But then we're also going to look at what would negative f of x be. And is that equal to f of negative x? Well, negative f of x is taking all of our function and changing the sign, basically. So that would be negative x cubed plus x squared minus 2. Is that the same as f of negative x? No. So this one is also not odd. So we'll just say neither. Okay, we'll look at one more of these. So f of negative x would be negative x cubed minus negative x plus 3 which is negative x cubed plus x plus 3. That's not the same as the original, so we are not even. And then we'll test for odd by looking at negative f of x, and that is negative x cubed plus x minus 3. guess I could turn off my ringer. We'll just change the signs in there. And that's not the same because of the minus 3 is not the same there. So it's also not odd. So neither of these functions were even or odd. Now what does a function look like if it's... Oh, do we have one more here? Oh, yeah, we do. Good. Okay. So, here, plug in again. F of negative x is negative x cubed minus negative x. So, that'll be negative x cubed plus x. That's not the same as the original function, so we are not even. And then negative f of x would be negative x cubed plus x. Well, guess what? We've got one that's the same. So this one is odd. Okay, so now what does it look like to be even or odd or neither? Well, remember we said even is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. This one is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Basically, if you folded it over, it would be the same on either side. So it is even. This one is not even because if we took this point, it's not coming back over like it would be folded. Is it odd? Well, the way we tell if it's odd is does everywhere where we have x, y give us negative x, negative y? So let's look at this point. That's, say, let's look at one that's a little bit easier. Let's look at this point. We'll just say it's 1, negative 2. If we move up here, is it the same negative, or negative 1, positive 2? Yes. So if they'll flip up and over, then we are odd. Okay, 
Next, we're going to look at piecewise functions. And piecewise functions are just functions that are um, pieced together, okay? They're pieced together from other functions. It, it is just what it says it is. So if we look at this one, we've got f of x is x squared plus 1 where x is less than 0. So everywhere where x is less than 0, we've graphed x squared plus 1. You can see it right there. And then we're using x minus 1 everywhere where x is greater than or equal to 0. So here's the graph of x minus 1 starting at 0 and including 0. So if it asks you to find some points, we want to find f of negative 1. So that's what's the y value when the x is negative 1. It's right here. The y value is 2. For the next one, what's the y value when the x value is 0? f of 0 is right here. So it's negative 1. And last, f of 5, the y value would be Four. So it's that simple. Looking at another one, we've got x squared plus 3, and we're going to graph this one. Oh, there's no graph. Oh, we don't need it. Never mind. Okay, so we've got x squared plus 3 everywhere where x is less than 2. 7 between 2 and 4, including 2 and 4. And then 2x, y equals 2x minus 1, where x is greater than 4. Okay? So it looks something like this. I don't know exactly, but something around in there. Okay. So h of 1. Well, what would that be? We want to look where would our x values fall for 1. Well, it would fall in the x is less than 2. So that means h of 1 would be, our, would be plugged into our x squared plus 3. And that gives us 4. Okay, h of 3. Where does h of 3 fall? Well, it falls between 2 and 4. So it is just 7. There's no x to plug in for. It's just 7. Next, h of 4. Well, that also falls between 2 and 4 since we've got that equal to there at the 4. So h of 4 is also 7. h of 5 falls in the x is greater than 4. So we're using the 2x minus 1. So 2 times 5 minus 1 is 9. To graph a function, basically what I do is I use a pencil, very important, <laughs> excuse me, and graph the function, the first one, and erase what I don't need. And then for the second one, I graph it and erase what I don't need. Do not do it in pen and mark out. That does not count as a correct graph, okay? You have to actually be able to physically erase. Or you could start from where it's supposed to be. I just find it easier to erase. So 1 half x plus 1, to graph that, we have a y-intercept at 1, and the slope is up 1 over 2. So, let's get this as close as I can. It looks like this. And it says everywhere where S, x is less than 2. So, 2 is right here. So, we need to erase everything greater than 2. And it's not including 2, so we're going to put an open dot right there. Okay? So that was the first one. The second one is negative x minus 1. So 
y-intercept of negative 1, and it's going down 1 over 1, but it's starting at 2 and going to the right greater than. So I need to erase stuff to the left. And so that would be our piecewise function. Let's try another one. So z of x is first y equals negative 1 where x is less than 0. So y equals negative 1 looks like this, only up to where x is 0. And it's an open dot because we're not including 0. And then we've got x minus 1 between 0 and 2. So I'm going to graph x minus 1. So it's actually starting right here. So it's going to fill in that dot. And up 1 over 1 until we get to 2. So there we go. And then it's including 2. And then the last one is 2x plus 6 everywhere where x is greater than 2. So 2x plus 6 has an x inter y intercept of 6, and it'll go down 1 over 1. And it's everywhere where x is greater than 2, so I'm going to need to be, do a little bit of erasing here. And there's an open dot right there where, I know my line's not perfect, but I can't draw a straight edge on here. Um, but that's the piecewise function of d of x. Next concept the greatest integer function. This is the greatest integer function. And here is what it is. It is the greatest, it, it, the greatest integer of x is the greatest integer less than or equal to x. So let's say we had 1. We want the greatest integer less than or equal to 1. Well, that would be 1, okay? What if we have 1 point, x equals 1.5? What's the greatest integer less than or equal to 1.5? 1. What's the greatest integer less than or equal to 2.5? 2. What's the greatest integer less than or equal to negative 1.5? 2. Okay, because we're going, we're going less than, so it would be 2. The greatest integer less than or equal to negative 2.5 is negative 3. Okay? So evaluate these. Pretty simple. Uh, the greatest integer less than or equal to 1.3 is 1. The greatest integer less than or equal to 5.6 is 5. The greatest integer less than or equal to negative 0 0.2 is not 0, negative 1. So we have to go lower than negative 0.2. And then the greatest integer less than or equal to 3 is just 3. Here we want to graph the greatest integer function. Okay? And we're graphing the greatest integer function minus 1. So, let's let x be negative 1.5, negative 1, zero, uh, nope, negative 0 0.5, 0 and then 0 0.5, 1, and 1.5. I'm doing decimals so we can see exactly what's happening here. So the greatest integer, we've got the greatest integer of negative 
minus 1. Let's start with something positive. It'll make it a little bit easier. So the greatest integer of 1 minus 1. That's the greatest integer of 0. So what's the greatest integer less than or equal to 0? 0. So at 1, we know that y is 0. Okay? 1.5. 1.5 minus 1 is just 0.5. The greatest integer less than or equal to 0.5 is 0. So we know at 1.5 that we're still at 0. 0 0.5. 0 0.5 minus 1 is negative 0.5. The greatest integer less than or equal to negative 0.5 is 0. So at 0 0.5, Oh, I think I've done something wrong. Nope, it's negative 1. Okay, easy to get confused. So down here. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. So the greatest integer less than or equal to negative 1 is negative 1. Negative 0.5 minus 1 is negative 1.5. The greatest integer less than or equal to negative 1.5 is negative 2. And then negative 1 minus negative 1 is negative 2. So that's going to give us negative 2 also. And then negative 1.5 minus 1 is negative 2.5 and the greatest integer less than or equal to negative 2.5 is negative 3. Oh, I graphed these wrong, didn't I? I need to move them over. Yeah, there we go. Okay. And so negative 1.5, negative 3. So you kind of get an idea, a little bit here anyway, that it's the same as our greatest integer function, but everything is moved down. So knowing what the greatest integer function looks like, then we're starting, we'll start with this one, and going over solid dot here, open dot, going over, solid dot, open, over. And then back the other direction. So in actuality, it's just the greatest integer function moved down one, because we looked at transformations, didn't we? Okay, so there's a little bit of it anyway. Okay, let's look at a word problem with the um, with a piecewise function. So a new job offer in sales promises a base salary of three thousand dollars a month. Once the salesperson reaches fifty thousand dollars in total sales. He earns his base salary plus a 4.3% commission on all sales of $50,000 or more. Write a piecewise defined function to model the expected total monthly salary as a function of the amount of sales. Okay, so first... We have that he's going to make a base salary of $3,000 a month. And he makes $3,000 if his sales are less than 
50,000, right? But he also, he makes the base salary of $3,000 plus a 4.3% commission. Change that to a decimal. So plus 0.043x if x is greater than or equal to 50,000 if he sells $50,000 or more. So there's a piecewise function from a word problem. Okay, and last we're looking at increasing, decreasing, and constant. So a function is increasing if it says for every x sub 1 less than x sub 2, then f of x sub 1 is less than x sub 2. Basically, if you're going from left to right, it's going up. That, okay? Don't make it harder than it is. If it's increasing, just like reading left to right, it's going up. If it's decreasing, then f of x1 is greater than f of x2. Okay? Going from left to right, it's decreasing it's going down and constant f of x1 is equal to f of x2 okay it's staying constant flat horizontal so here we're going to use interval notation to determine whether it's increasing or where the graph is increasing decreasing and constant so it's increasing from negative infinity until negative 2 And we don't include the negative 2 in there because at negative 2 itself is just a point. Okay, it's not increasing at one point, it's just there. So, but it's increasing somewhere else here. It's also increasing, so we'll union from 2 to infinity. Where is it decreasing? From 0 to 2. And where is it constant? From negative 2 to 0. Okay. The next one, where is it increasing? It's not. It's not increasing anywhere. Where is it decreasing? Well, it's decreasing everywhere right so from negative infinity to infinity and it's not constant anywhere and the last concept we look at is relative minimum and maximums so a maximum is the highest point of the graph a minimum is the lowest point of the graph well, what's this relative got to do to, with it? Well, the relative means it's the highest or lowest point within a specific interval. So this graph continues to go up forever and ever. So clearly this is not the maximum point because it's increasing forever. But it is a relative maximum. It is a spot where it is at the crest of a hill and everywhere on either side of it is lower, right? So that's what makes it a relative maximum. A relative minimum is a spot on the graph, a point on the graph, where everything around it is higher, okay? Even if it is not the lowest on the graph. So here where it says the point blank is the lowest point in a small interval surrounding x equals... Okay, so where's a low point on here? A low point would be right here. So the point negative 2, negative 1, is the lowest point in a small interval x equals... Well, that's x equals negative 2. So at x equals negative 2, 
the function has a relative minimum of negative 1. I have a feeling, oh, it is there, okay. And then the point 0, 1 is the highest point in a small interval surrounding x equals 0. At x equals 0, the function has a relative maximum of 1. Here, at x equals, we'll start with this one, negative 1, the function has a relative minimum of negative 2. At x equals 4, the function has a relative minimum of 0. And at x equals 2, it has a relative maximum of 3. And lastly, look at this function. Does it have any relative minimum or maximums? No, it keeps increasing, except for right there at 0. So there are none. And that concludes section 17.